The students and teachers at La Mahia Ishahid Public School in Kabul are anxious for some kind of normal routine. Some children bring their own chairs to school if they have them. The school was almost destroyed by war. There's no electricity. It's colder inside than out. The cement floor is freezing. But these grade two students don't mind. The young women and girls at this school are back in the classroom after five years of banishment by the Taliban. In five years, uh, we have uh, some difficulty about our education. Our, uh, we sit at home, uh, there's no school, there's no courses for girls, and uh, we have a lot of problems. These women are in their 20s, and yet they've returned to grade 11. You would expect them to be bitter. I'm very happy because I can uh, progress my lesson, my education, and it is very good and we are very happy. We see some brightness in our life and uh, I try to study my lessons and become a good engineer and help my people and country. Getting children back to school is the number one priority of Afghanistan's post-war government. But the big question is, what will they learn? The girls get more than math here. They're also getting a reality lesson. Bullets are the math teacher's prop for a lesson in subtraction. It isn't the teacher's idea. During decades of war, the classroom has been the best place to indoctrinate young people with their duty to fight. Government-sponsored textbooks in Afghanistan are filled with violence. For years, war was the only lesson that counted. The Mujahideen, Afghanistan's freedom fighters, used the classroom to prepare children to fight the Soviet Empire. <coughs> The Russians are long gone now, but the textbooks are not. The Mujahideen had wanted to prepare the next generation of Afghans to fight the enemy. So the pupils learn the proper clips for a Kalashnikov rifle the weight of bombs needed to flatten the house, how to calculate the speed of bullets. Even the girls learn it. They too had to support the jihad. But the Mujahideen had a lot of help to create this warrior culture in the school system from a surprising source. It was actually the United States that paid for this Mujahideen propaganda in the textbooks. The University of Nebraska did the publishing. It was all part of American Cold War policy in the 1980s, helping the Mujahideen defeat the Soviet army on Afghan soil. 11,000 kilometers and many centuries away from Kabul in Omaha, Nebraska, America's heartland. where a great symbol of communism is reduced to a boutique for Slavic imports. Here you find the values that led the United States into Afghanistan in the 1980s to defeat the evil empire, the Soviet Union. The University of Nebraska was front and center in that effort. It had an Afghan study center and a gung-ho director who was ready to help defeat the Red Menace.
I think Ronald Reagan himself felt that this was a violation of the rights of the of the Afghans. I think a lot of those working for him thought this was an opportunity for us to um, do the Soviet Union some damage. Tom Gutierrez was a man with a lot of ideas on how to do some damage to the Soviet Union. He was behind the Mujahideen textbook project. Gutierrez's personal involvement in Afghanistan began in 1964 as a young U.S. Peace Corps volunteer. Over the years, he rubbed shoulders with Mujahideen leaders and he learned Afghan languages. During the 1980s, his love of America and his love of Afghanistan merged. We were living in an era in which the Afghans were trying to, trying to survive. Try, were fighting for their survival, in which a million of them were killed, you know, and a million and a half wounded, as I indicated, and refugees, and etc. So um, at that time, I think, you know, uh, there was a lot of militaristic thinking. The Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan in 1979. Its fighting forces were well armed and ruthless. The Mujahideen fought the Soviets throughout the 1980s with a lot of covert aid from the United States. In 1986, under President Ronald Reagan, the U.S. put a rush order on its proxy war in Afghanistan. The CIA gave the Mujahideen an overwhelming arsenal of guns and missiles. But a lesser known fact is that the U.S. also gave the Mujahideen hundreds of millions of dollars in non-lethal aid. 43 million just for the school textbooks. The U.S. Agency for International Development, AID, coordinated its work with the CIA, which ran the weapons program. We were providing education behind the enemy lines. Uh, we were providing, you know, military support against the enemy lines. So this was a kind of coordinated effort indeed. I uh, eventually was involved in some of the discussions, negotiations for um, removing the Soviets from Afghanistan. I, I was a, an American specialist in these discussions and many people in those discussions said just as important as uh, you know the introduction of Stinger missiles was the introduction of the humanitarian assistance because the Soviets never believed that the US would go to that extent. The US government told the AID to let the Afghan war chiefs like Gulbuddin Hekmetyar decide the school curriculum and the contents of the textbooks. What discussions did you have with the Mujahideen leaders? Did you, did, was there any effort to say maybe this isn't the best for an eight-year-old's mind? No, because we were told that, we, that that was not, a, you know, not for negotiation. And that, you know, that, again, the content was up to, was, up, was to be that which they decided. We had a lot of mistakes during the jihad, and this was one of them. The we Seema Samar is the interim government's minister of women's affairs. She ran a school in those days, and she opposed the textbook project, but it did little good. I was opposing, but we, we had no choice. We had no choice. It was already done. And actually, nobody had that much freedom to say against it. Because they were putting up the money. They're putting out the money and the culture. I mean, uh, nobody had the freedom to f speech, to speak against all those things. I was interested in, in being of any type of assistance that I could to help the Afghans get out of their mess. And, and to be frank, you know, uh, also uh, anything that would help the United States, uh, you know, advance its interests. United States interests were well served. But after the defeat of the Soviet Empire, the U.S. abandoned Afghanistan. The country descended into civil war. Kabul today is in ruins. The children who attend Lamahia Ishahid school live in this neighborhood. It was on the front lines, and the battle scars are everywhere. The U.S. gave almost no money to help rebuild after the war against the Soviets and no money to rewrite the school textbooks. Rashid Kosel lives here. His father returned from where the family was hiding one day to check on their apartment, and he was shot dead. Rashid is 11 years old. 
His country has been at war for his entire life. And another countries have uh, have peace. Uh, and Afghanistan, why why Afghanistan having peace? I think with myself, why Afghanistan having peace? And my mother said to uh, to me, uh, it's no, there's no any country to help Afghanistan. The boys go to school in the afternoon when the girls go home. Rashid loves school, but he says he and the other boys don't understand why their books are filled with war. The Afghan people hate the uh, wars. Uh, they can, they can, don't, don't do any big mistake. This is big mistake to worrying. This word is not good to small, uh, small boys in uh, their books. The teachers at Rashid's school agree. Hama Youssef is an author and a history teacher. She's leading a campaign to change her school's curriculum. Hama Youssef had no work under the Taliban. Since she returned this spring, she's found the extreme Taliban religious ideology is still in the school system. But it's the war propaganda, she says, that disturbs the students most. The students represent any hope Afghanistan might have to build a civil society modeled on that of other countries. But young people fear Afghanistan may be sucked into more war if they can't change the country's values. The young women especially fear the war culture still dominates. They don't want peace. They want war. And uh, they want the people to uh, see the war and uh, have uh, mind, war mind. They want them to have war minds, yeah. the boys and girls. The boys and girls. When we are coming to school, uh, our um, purpose is that, that we want to learn something, uh, that they, they will be perfect and important, and they will uh, make our future better. We, want, we don't come to school or maybe to every part of educational places to, come, uh, to learn something about killing, about to, uh, or it means we don't want to be a killer person or we don't want to be a robber. There are no desks, no paper or pens, and not much chalk. And there are bird nests in the lighting fixtures. Homa Youssef can't change that, but she has abandoned offensive parts of the curriculum. <laughs> There's a tremendous desire for change in Afghanistan. The government says it wants to completely overhaul the school system now, to modernize education. The task is enormous. Most schools are in ruins like Mahmoud Tarzi High School, bombed out and abandoned since 1994. The interim government declared education the bedrock of Afghanistan's future, but the buildings themselves are mere rubble. In what was once English language class, the final exam is still on the board. A mocking reminder of the children whose dreams of an education have been dashed over and over again. At the Ministry of Education, the corridors are clogged with broken furniture. 
There's no heat in the offices where Kabul scholars labor to rewrite the school curriculum. They go through the textbooks line by line, locating hateful passages. They circle references to mujahideen and jihad and substitute them with innocuous words like apples and oranges. <laughs> Director of the new curriculum, Din Mohammed Miltzer, says there are three objectives. To make a real Muslim, a civilized Afghan, and a peace, love of peace, peace, love, what should I call it? A person who loves peace. person who loves peace. These are the three main subjects or main aims of our curriculum to make it. To make a good Muslim, so, to make a modern Afghan, and to make someone who loves peace. Yes. No one is being paid here, and the work is very hard. Trying to remove a culture of violence that was in the society long before the Americans paid to put it into writing. Can you really change those values in your society by changing these words in your books? Well, it's difficult. It's really it's difficult. It's, it's very difficult. But we tried. Try to make the people civilized. But it's a value coming from our fathers, fathers, forefathers. Okay. And changing of that is not too easy. So take, take time. The latest war in Afghanistan is now over, but there's a constant threat of a new one. In the markets, tailors make uniforms for the stream of young men who want to be mercenaries. Only hunting guns are sold now, since the heavy weapons are banned, but they still exist, woven into the very fabric of the country. The United States didn't create the war culture in Afghanistan, it just used it. Famous warriors like Northern Alliance General Ahmad Massoud are like deities here. The International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, controls violence in Kabul. This German unit of ISAF protects the neighborhood around Lamahia Ishahid School. On this day, the soldiers see something in the hills but have no binoculars. They ask to use the zoom on our camera to get a better look. As they scan the horizon, one gets a sense that ISAF is a very thin blue line of defense. And the water stopped me. What they see through the lens is suspicious. Warlords are a constant threat, and the neighborhood is vulnerable. The soldiers head up the hills for a better look. ISAF is on the lookout for Taliban and Al-Qaeda terrorists. The United States spent $3 billion to help defeat the Soviet army here, but in the chaos left behind was the seeds of this new enemy for the U.S. At the University of Nebraska, Tom Gutierrez is unapologetic for using Afghanistan to fight the Soviets, but he regrets that the country was abandoned. Yes, $3 billion is, seems like a lot of money. It's certainly a lot of money for me. Uh, but in the long-term scheme of things, uh, it was probably a very, very inexpensive investment because what happened? You know, that the last major battle of the Cold War in Afghanistan was the final straw upon the Soviet camel's back. And um, it was a good investment and probably a, a small one. What we didn't understand was that there needed to be a subsequent small investment to preclude Afghanistan from uh, becoming a failed state, falling into the clutches of extremism. Mujahideen. As children return to school in Afghanistan this spring, the new textbooks are arriving with new ideas, but the same old publisher. The University of Nebraska has the contract again, with six and a half million dollars from the United States government. This time, says Seema Samar, people like herself will keep closer tabs. All of the cabinet members 
Specifically, I did discuss with the people who want to, uh, to fund, again, the textbooks, the curriculum for the schools. I said, please, we don't want that kind of things. They should include even human rights in the textbooks instead of all those. They should remove all the jihadi items from the book. So this time they said they promised that there will be nothing violent on it. The children of Afghanistan don't need books to tell them about war. It's all around them. Only a fraction will be exposed to the new ideas in the school system. Only 3% of all Afghanistan's girls have enrolled, 39% of its boys. For those who are privileged enough to attend, aid agencies are rushing to supply furniture and equipment, and the Afghan government has introduced a new curriculum. Instead of learning how to use a landmine, children will now learn how to avoid one. Instead of learning how to make war, hopefully they'll now learn how to avoid it. There are many old traditions Homa Youssef wants to change, but it has to start with a break from the warrior past. Maybe it'll take years, but we will try to do that. We will try to finish all those cultures. We want to take the society back to civilized, democratic society. The pleasures of childhood are so simple. A kite to fly a friend to share your dreams with, maybe a good storybook. In Afghanistan, a child's pleasure is simply an end to 23 years of war. For The National, I'm Carol Off in Kabul, Afghanistan.